Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our briefing this afternoon to discuss EPA's Clean Power Plan. Will it work? Will it be upheld? Big questions that we're going to be looking at this afternoon. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and we're very glad that you're here to be part of this whole discussion that indeed is a very complicated one. We know that certainly since the Environmental Protection Agency came forward last year with their draft proposal for the Clean Power Plan, that there have been many, many questions. There's been a lot of consternation in different places. There's also been um, a, a very mixed views across the country and among different sectors and among policymakers at all levels. Suffice it to say, many times there's been confusion, there has been certainly interest, uh, and, and also as people have looked for ways in which to really reduce greenhouse emissions in all sectors of our economy, and particularly in terms of the power sector. This is a very, very important piece of the policies that have been put forward by the Obama administration. I think that the EPA has tried to crisscross the country to meet with countless people and organizations and industry groups over and over and have made quite clear that what they put out, that they were wanting to really uh, uh, ascertain reactions, and they certainly have received those with uh, about four million comments that have been received uh, on their docket page. And indeed, we are very, very pleased this afternoon to have this opportunity to hear from two people who have really looked at this whole issue uh, with regard to the Clean Power Plan and kind of the whole history around clean air regulation and bring a great deal of experience to this whole area of the law and thinking about how it does get implemented at different levels of government. So to start us off this afternoon, I'm pleased to introduce Michael Berger. Mike is the Executive Director of the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School. His, his current research in advocacy focuses on domestic and international efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to promote climate change adaptation through pollution control, resource management, land use planning, and through green finance. He has written and published a great deal and is a co-founder and member of the Environmental Law Collaborative. Before joining Columbia Law School, he had uh, been at the Roger Williams University School of Law where he was an associate professor and taught environmental law, administrative law, and literature. He was also director of the Environmental and Land Use Law in Externship Program. He also brings experience from teaching at uh, NYU School of Law and he had been in the Environmental Law Division of New York City's Office of Corporation Counsel. So again, he brings a number of years of experience of looking at important environmental law issues. Mike. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, Carol, uh, and thanks to EESI for inviting me down. Uh, to give this talk today. So I'm coming from the Sabin Center for Climate Change Law at Columbia Law School, where we have as our mission to develop innovative legal techniques to combat climate change. And we do that on both the mitigation and adaptation fronts. Um, one of the, um, and, and we do this by um, developing techniques and then training uh, law students and lawyers in their use, and then working with partners in the government, academic, nonprofit, and private sectors to try and implement these, these approaches to legal innovation. One of the things that we do is uh, we track very closely developments, obviously, um, in regulation and legislation and the courts, and we've been very closely following EPA's regulation of greenhouse gas emissions through the Clean Air Act um, and the litigation challenges that have been brought to those regulations. And that's what I'll be talking about today. So 
Um, I'm going to start off by giving sort of a, a brief and simplified uh, background on the Clean Air Act, on what EPA has been up to, and on some of the key Supreme Court cases that have touched on EPA regulation. Uh, then turn briefly to the Section 111B, New Source Performance Standards for New Sources, um, and the and take a little bit more time to talk about Section 111D, which are the uh, new source performance standards for, uh, ex well, the, the standards for existing plants uh, and the legal debate that has surrounded that initiative. So the basic breakdown of the Clean Air Act is that it regulates it through a number of different mechanisms, and there are a number of different ways that it breaks out. Um, first of all, it regulates by air pollutant type. Criteria pollutants, which are the national ambient air quality standard pollutants, um, hazardous pollutants, uh, or so HAPS under Section 112, um, and then other pollutants, which are greenhouse gas emissions, um, among other things. It also regulates differently by source type. So mobile sources are regulated under one title of the Act, and stationary sources are regulated under other titles of the Act. Um, finally, it matters where you are and whether you're in compliance with national ambient air quality standards in terms of what standards will apply. If you're in an attainment area, one set of standards applies. If you're in a non-attainment area, another set of standards applies. There are a number of shortcomings um, for the Clean Air Act when it comes to dealing with the climate change problem. It was quite simply not written to address this problem. Um, so uh, looked at most honestly, it was designed to deal with local and regional air quality problems, not global uh, climate change. Uh, the numerical thresholds for getting in under certain provisions are far too low to deal with the quantity of um, emissions that you have when dealing with carbon dioxide. Um, and it's a poor fit with international mechanisms that are currently being constructed. The performance and technology standards have a number of problems as well. Um, but I'll focus on the last uh, note there, which is that they're primarily for pollution sources. Right? They don't apply to alternatives to sort of end of the pipe um, reductions uh, and they don't address consumption and behavior, consumer behavior. Um, they're designed primarily to address new sources and there's a limited history and limited ability to deal with emissions from existing sources, um, doesn't cover land use, and there are no real funds in the act to deal with climate change. So turning to the history of uh, greenhouse gas emissions uh, regulation, it all kind of started with a petition to regulate greenhouse gas emissions from motor vehicles back in the early 2000s. Um, and this was brought because Section 202 of the Clean Air Act provides that the administrator shall um, basically regulate, quote unquote, any air pollutant, uh, which in the EPA administrator's judgment uh, causes or contributes to air pollution that endangers the public health. And so there was a petition filed by environmental groups in a number of states to make such an endangerment finding. Um, one of the key issues that wound up arising in the EPA's determination was whether or not carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gas emissions could be considered an air pollutant under the meaning of the act. So many years um, after the petition was filed, EPA did respond and decided that it would not, in fact, make such an endangerment finding. It actually decided that it would not make a decision whether to make an endangerment finding. And it gave two reasons. One reason was that greenhouse gas emissions, carbon dioxide, are not air pollutants under the meaning of the act. Uh, and second, that even if it were, they would probably decide to decline to exercise their discretion to make such a judgment, so to make an endangerment finding at this time, or at that time. Um, that case uh, wound up going up to the Supreme Court in the Mass versus EPA decision, where the Supreme Court ruled that carbon dioxide is an air pollutant and that EPA does have the authority to regulate and that the reasons that it gave for not doing so were inadequate. And so they didn't have to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, but they had to go back and make the determination and give a better explanation if they were going to not do so. Um, when they went back and looked at it again and there was a change of administration, lo and behold, EPA decided that there was an endangerment and so moved forward with the finding. What that finding did was trigger everything that has happened since. So on the one hand, you have the motor vehicle rule um, where EPA has um, reduced greenhouse gas emissions through a combined program um, with NHTSA regarding CAFE standards, um, which in turn triggers requirements under 
the New Source Performance Standards, and the PSD, the Prevention of Significant Deterioration Program. Um, while this was all going on, there was a separate lawsuit that was filed um, in, uh, in the mid-2000s, and that was a, po a common law nuisance claim, where a number of states, the city of New York, and three land trusts, three private land trusts, filed a common law nuisance claim against four power companies and the Tennessee Valley Authority, saying that their contributions to climate change amounted to a federal common law public nuisance, and asking the courts to impose uh, limitations on their, their carbon dioxide emissions. So they were actually seeking an injunction to regulate from the courts. By the time it got up to the Supreme Court, much of the, some, some EPA had begun to regulate. Uh, they had already regulated motor vehicle emissions, and they were starting to regulate stationary sources as well. And what the Supreme Court ruled in AEP versus Connecticut was that the Clean Air Act and EPA regulation it authorizes preempted or displaced the federal common law nuisance. So um, the common law has no role any longer in dealing with direct regulation of greenhouse gas emissions. So um, we're going to focus now briefly on the PSD program um, and the regulation of sources under there. So it matters whether you're looking at the PS, which program you're looking at. Uh, the new source performance, and it matters because the standards that will apply to the stationary sources differ. If you're regulating under the NSPS program, you have the best system of emissions reduction uh, technology that is adequately demonstrated. If you're dealing with new source review, it's lowest, it's LAER. If you're dealing with PSD, it's best available control technology. It also matters because the regions where they apply are different. Um, NSPS are everywhere, NSR is in non-attainment, PSD is in attainment. The scope also matters. NSPS are the only nationwide standards that you see up here. The others are facility specific. Finally, it matters because EPA establishes the new source performance standards, whereas the standards for uh, prevention of significant deterioration and new source review are usually set by states under the existing cooperative federalism programs um, set up under the Clean Air Act. So um, PSD kicks in because um, under the regulation it applies to regulated new source review pollutants and that includes any pollutant that is otherwise subject to regulation under the act. But there are these quantitative limits that apply um, and the term major, so they don't, the, the PSD provisions only apply to major emitting facilities and a major emitting facility is one that is defined by the quantity of pollution the, that emits or has the potential to emit 100 tons per year um, or 250 tons per year. The problem for climate change, of course, is that the number of sources that meet this threshold are extraordinary. You're talking about very, very, very small sources that would satisfy these quantitative requirements. So in order to address that problem, uh, EPA issued the tailoring rule in 2010, um, which fit with, said that it was going to phase in regulation of greenhouse gas emissions under the PSD program. In step one, they were going to regulate, they're going to regulate sources that are already subject to the PSD requirements, the so-called anyway sources. Then they were going to, at step two, um, include other sources. And these other sources are sources that are not otherwise under the PSD program. So they would come under the PSD program solely because of the quantity of greenhouse gas emissions that they were, that they emit. And then under step three, the EPA says it's going to address smaller sources. Um, so the lawsuit that was brought challenging this tailoring rule, among other things, um, started off as the Coalition for Responsible Regulation versus EPA. There were actually a, a large number of lawsuits that were filed, but this is the simplest way to refer to all of them. Um, and there the DC Circuit upheld the tailpipe and the timing rules, so the motor vehicle rules and the rules that EPA had um, promulgated saying this is the timing they're going to approach. The DC Circuit said that the Clean Air Act in fact compels EPA's interpretation that both anyway sources and these other sources are included in the PSD program. And then finally they denied standing to the uh, plaintiffs to challenge certain other aspects of what EPA was doing. Um, this was affirmed in part in the UARG case from last year. So the question that was presented in UARG, uh, United Air um, Resources Group versus EPA, 
was the, whether EPA permissibly determined that its regulation from new motor vehicles triggered these requirements under the PSD provisions. And um, we have, on the one hand, the Supreme Court upheld EPA's interpretation as a reasonable one to regulate the anyway sources, and then they rejected EPA's interpretation that it had the authority to regulate these other sources, which would come in only because of their greenhouse gas emissions, um, as un unreasonable. And that was basically the, the key outcome of that case. Um, this, of course, is an important case because power plants uh, contribute a large quantity of um, the greenhouse gas emissions from stationary sources. Um, and as you'll see on the bottom left of the slide here, the anyway sources uh, account for the bulk of it. Right? So um, while there was certainly some mixed uh, responses from the environmental community about this, 83% of the emissions are captured under the Supreme Court's decision in this case. Only 3% are left out. So turning to the, um, to the new source performance standards uh, on the right side of the slide, this happens under a different section of the Act. So now we're looking at section 111B of the, of the Act, uh, which says that the administrator shall publish a list um, and publish regulations for these source categories. Um, what EPA has done so far was they issued a preliminary proposal for new source performance standards for um, new or modified stationary sources um, and their greenhouse gas emissions. They revised the proposal. Uh, they said that there were gonna be separate standards for natural gas and coal-fired plants. Uh, basically, coal-fired plants are going to require carbon capture and sequestration, a technology that um, has been demonstrated to some degree in several pilot projects that have received federal funding, but has not been necessarily widely disseminated or shown to be um, economically viable for every power plant. The final rule is expected this summer. Um, and the big question with this rule is, is anyone building new, new coal-fired power plants? And the answer simply in this country is no. Um, they're building them elsewhere, but they're, but they're not building them here. Uh, so it's a, th to the extent that this would require CCS, it's a small universe of facilities that are going to be affected, if any. So there were um, some early challenges to the rule. Uh, as far back as 2012, there was a, a challenge to a portion of the rule uh, that, a, that the D.C. Circuit rejected as being not ripe. The decision was not yet final. Uh, there was another case filed in Nebraska District Court that made a particular argument that said that the 2005 EP Act um, basically barred EPA from pegging new source performance standards to CCS because it was not an adequately demonstrated technology. Um, and I, I expect that we might see that again, but uh, that argument again, but for the time being, the case was kicked out of court, dismissed, because it was not a final rule. So turning finally to section 111D, which has been the, the, the part of all of this that is most in the news and is really the clean power plan that, that um, is at issue today, um, the, the section 111D provides that the administrator is going to establish um, a standard. Uh, and it's going to use best system of emissions reduction in order to establish this standard for the states. And then states are going to submit plans similar to that provided by Section 110 um, in order to come into compliance with this standard. And the, the, section, the similar to Section 110 plans is important because that's the provision, that's the section of the Act that provides for state implementation plans. Right? Um, so uh, Ken is going to talk a bit more about this. These, these so the plans, the Section 111D plans are supposed to be similar to SIPs, but they're not SIPs. And the federal implementation plan that EPA will create under Section 111D is not a Section 110 FIP either. But they're similar. So what's happening here? Well, EPA must act through the states under Section 111D. To that extent, it's very similar to what happens with criteria pollutants under 108, 109, and 110. Right? States have to be given sort of first crack at this. So the schedule right now, uh, we're on, t on track for our summer 2015 final uh, guidelines, uh, a proposed federal implementation plan. Uh, states then are supposed to submit their SIPs, or their, it says SIPs here, but SIP, their 111D plans 
uh, by summer 2016. States will uh, kind of automatically get a one-year extension, as I understand it, if they request it, and a two-year extension if they're going to participate in a multi-state plan. Um, and then compliance will actually kick in in summer of 2020. So what are the guidelines? Well, the overall goal is nationwide to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions from affected sources 30% below the 2005 levels. Uh, each state has allocated its own emission performance goal. Each state has to submit a plan, and EPA will impose a plan where states either refuse to submit uh, or submit a plan that's determined to be inadequate. The basis for the 111D, uh, for, the, for the guidelines or the, the goals that the states are going to have to achieve um, are these so-called building blocks. And again, Ken will talk, I think, in more detail about these. Uh, but the proposed rule relies on four so-called building blocks. Heat improvement, heat rate improvement at affected um, units, uh, the substitution of gas-fired for coal-fired plants, um, substitution of nuclear or renewable generation for carbon-based um, generation, and then the use of demand-side energy efficiency that reduces generation. So here, EPA is relying, you remember earlier on, I said that one of the problems is that the Clean Air Act doesn't really address consumer behavior um, or consumption of energy. Here, EPA is relying on that as a building block to determine what the standard is for the states. So the principal legal arguments um, that have, all, some of which have already materialized and some of which will materialize shortly, um, EPA cannot regulate, regulate these units at all under Section 111D uh, because they're already regulated under Section 112 and the Hazardous Air Pollutants Program. EPA cannot regulate beyond the fence line. That is, they can't require the uh, inclusion of new facilities uh, that are not already included, renewable energy, nuclear energy, and they can't um, require states to do anything concerning, concerning consumption. Um, the BSER, the best system of emissions reduction determination, is unreasonable because it looks at these beyond the fence line measures. Um, and then finally, as a sort of catch-all, EPA is not the energy regulator, and so anything that it has to, anything that it says that really pertains to energy is beyond its authority. So there has been um, one lawsuit that was filed already. Um, there actually is a second, West Virginia versus EPA, that I'm not going to touch on. But the Murray Energy Corporation case uh, was filed in 2014. Um, and this is the case that says, because they're regulating these same facilities under 112 in the Hazardous Air Pollutants Program, they cannot regulate under 111D. Um, Note that the, there was an argument last week or the week before um, on this Michigan versus EPA case where some of these same parties were arguing that the EPA's regulation under Section 112 uh, was improper. So uh, the defense is EPA's action is not final. So this case, like the other cases that I've mentioned so far, was just not, is, is, is not properly in court. Um, and then there's a tricky issue of statutory interpretation about this House amendment and the Senate amendment and which one is the proper way to read Section 112. Um, <clears throat> in addition, we have the um, more popular and more visible uh, arguments that have been set forth by Professor Lawrence Tribe, um, first as, uh, as an amicus in the Murray Energy case and then more publicly um, in various, in testimony to Congress, in publications, and through Senator Mitch McConnell's um, reliance on his arguments in his letter to governors encouraging them to refuse to comply. In essence, there are a few arguments that Professor Tribe makes. Um, one is that the process of creating and developing these state plans and any federal plan violates the Tenth Amendment and amounts to an unconstitutional commandeering of state resources. Um, that the burdens on coal plants in particular are unconstitutional because, or are an unconstitutional taking because they interfere with investment back expectations. Um, that the singling out of coal amounts to a violation of the um, coal plant's due process rights. That the interpretation that EPA has offered expands uh, their authority beyond their st the statutory authorization, and all of which for any lawyers in the room sort of gets bracketed under or 
under the single umbrella that these raise serious constitutional questions and so EPA's interpretation has to be determined to be unreasonable and can't be given deference under the Chevron doctrine. Now there are a number of responses to these arguments um, and I'll quickly summarize them here. Um, first, there's no 10th Amendment issue because what's happening under Section 111 is um, analogous to Section 110 and the SIPS, FIPS process. In fact, it's very similar to the cooperative federalism model that has existed uh, in the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and other federal le legislation for the, over 40 years. Um, in addition, the Clean Power Plan, as proposed, does not mandate any specific state action and, in fact, preserves state flexibility to use whatever mix of um, measures the states find appropriate to achieve the given standard. Um, and as I said, this is the same thing that's been done for, for over 40 years um, under Section 110. It's not a taking because the power plants still have significant value. I think that the estimate is that power plants will still contribute 30%. I mean that coal plants will still contribute 30% of the nation's energy supply um, under the Clean Power Plan, um, and nat certainly natural gas-fired power plants are not going anywhere. Um, also, uh, businesses are not insulated from future regulation by the takings clause. If every time there um, was a new environmental problem that was discovered, um, the existing polluters were insulated from regulation by takings clause, there would be very little ability to deal with environmental problems. Um, finally, the interpretation um, doesn't expand EPA's authority because these existing plants are already under EPA jurisdiction. So very, very briefly, um, I want to touch on the Just Say No campaign. <clears throat> the, 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 the gist of Senator McConnell's letter is that Professor Tribe's legal rhetoric is reliable and appropriate, um, that EPA is attempting to compel states to do more than they would do on their own, um, that Supreme Court precedent basically counsels against allowing EPA to undertake any such expansion of its authority, um, that the deadlines that are imposed, this 2016, 2017, 2018 deadline, they're all there in order to force states to act before this litigation can be resolved, and that ultimately submission of a plan is tantamount to surrender to EPA's uh, control. Why states should ignore this? Um, first of all, as I said, the, the legal rhetoric lacks legal merit. Um, if, you say, if a state says no, it in fact does cede control to EPA because EPA will then be the one de designing the plan for the state. Um, EPA will likely be limited in what it can do within the state's boundaries, um, but it will still be the one designing the plan, and so the state is in fact surrendering control to EPA in that instance. Rate, paper, rate payers uh, likely fare worse under a FIP because it likely will be limited to power plants um, and these other more innovative measures will be uh, difficult if not impossible for EPA to implement. So rate payers will, will get stuck with the bill. Um, and then there are a number of other uh, reasons that are summarized there. The most important one being that climate change is not going away. The Supreme Court has said that EPA has the authority to regulate under the Clean Air Act there's a natural, natural sequence that I've sort of traced over the course of this presentation that leads ineluctably to the conclusion that EPA will be regulating power plants or that power plants will be regulated under Section 111D. So if not now, it will come at some future point. Um, finally, you know, the right side um, of, this, of this chart basically shows the contribution of coal to greenhouse gas emissions by the entire um, U.S. economy um, and the natural gas power uh, and the natural gas power plants as well, in the lighter blue there. So you can see that, and it's really necessary to address emissions from this sector in order to address greenhouse gas emissions and the climate change problem in the United States. The last slide I have here um, just shows. If we continue with business as usual along the top there, how, how far we exceed our global climate budget of 450 parts per million, which would keep us within the two degree goal that has been uh, recognized by the international community as a goal which will keep us, that beyond which we get into the you know, unknown unknowns scenario. Um, so you can see here that you know, state compliance with this particular plan will go a long way towards achieving our eventual goals. Thanks very much.
And that was a very impressive tutorial that you just walked us through. Uh, but we thought that it was really important to kind of understand some of the, the history of the uh, cases that had been brought with regard to the Clean Air Act and to walk through a lot of these issues and what are some of the key legal um, uh, arguments that are being raised and and what what do we know, what do we understand about all of them. So now we are going to turn and take another look at, okay, so, so what does this mean in terms of, well, if if we're going to have some sort of a clean power plan, we don't know exactly what it will look like in terms of the issuance of that final rule, but how would it work? What do we know in terms of how could it work? Because what we've heard is that, and you know that that states would be given a lot of flexibility, uh, some direction, but a lot of flexibility to come up with what they would see as being more appropriate for their own situation. And, and from a state perspective, sometimes that's good, sometimes not so good in terms of looking at all that flexibility. So to talk to us about that, uh, we have somebody who it has comes from working a lot with states uh, in the past, and Ken Colburn, who is going to uh, address this issue in just a few minutes, is a senior associate with the U.S. Program for the Regulatory Assistance project or commonly known as rap, but he does not really do music as part of this whole thing. I just didn't want to um, mislead you about that. And rap, uh, rap plays a very um, uh, kind of un unusual and very uh, important and helpful role, I think, in so many different policy fronts across the country in terms of thinking about air regulation, all sorts of energy policy. Uh, for state regulators at the commission level, energy offices, uh, air offices, etc., uh, and it is actually a nonprofit group of of um, experienced former utility and environmental regulators who provide assistance to public utility commissions and regulatory agencies throughout the U.S., throughout China, the EU, in India. Before that, Ken actually had been with an independent consultancy doing work uh, on energy, air, water, climate issues in which he was providing assistance and working through different kinds of climate plans with um, NGOs, with progressive companies, with foundations, uh, with, with a variety of different state agencies. And I first met Ken uh, many years ago, or a number of years ago, that sounds better, a number of years ago, when he was the executive director of NESCOM, which is the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management. And, and before that, he had led the Air Resources Division for the state of New Hampshire. And he had also worked for a business group in, in New Hampshire. So he brings a great deal of experience across sectors in terms of working for business, working at the state and regional level on all of these issues, and now working with a group of former regulators to really help um, states, to help businesses, to help um, all sorts of stakeholders look at these issues and what do they mean and, and how would one go about starting to design and implement uh, something like the Clean Power Plan. Ken? Thanks, Carol, and thanks for your kind words. I, uh, I'm reminded of a time when uh, my, my position in New Hampshire was a political appointee, and I was nominated by a Republican initially, and, uh, and he and I were riding up in the elevator one day in the State House, and uh, he was trying to introduce me to another fellow on the uh, on the elevator, and he couldn't remember, you know, all the lengthy names of these divisions of state agencies. And I, I interrupted him halfway through, so I'm the state airhead. <laughs> so yeah, that that may be the easiest way, and may also explain some of my remarks uh, as well. Let's uh, see if I can learn how to drive this thing. You'll note before I do that I slightly modified Carol's uh, introduction here. Will it work? Uh, I guess. I have a light, no, it doesn't show on the screen. Sorry about that. Uh, will it work? I'm not sure I know or anybody know at this point, uh, but how will it work? I do have some insights uh, with respect to 
prior experience on the air side. So uh, Carol's already given the introduction. The only thing I would add is that uh, as a group of veteran regulators, mostly PUC and, and some air guys, um, I like to frame it as we advise current regulators to so they can avoid making the same mistakes we did. Um, we, uh, we are non-advocacy, so there were not four million and one comments. We did not file comments, and we don't intervene in dockets or in uh, notice and comment proceedings. We just have quiet conversations with existing regulators so they can depend on us rather than figuring they'll see us in an advocacy role around the corner. Uh, Carol already gave you my background, so let's turn to what I hope to cover for you today. Um, I want to set aside a bit of the hype and just look at what some of the markets are saying to start with. It's always useful to look at what the markets think about things uh, as a compass. And then touch on a number of ideas of how the clean power plan uh, is likely to work and then just some key takeaways. There's more than these ideas or issues as well. So hopefully we'll have some time for you to uh, raise yours. Um, Setting aside the hype and looking at the markets, this is an excerpt from a, a recent piece that UBS put out. Um, it uh, starts with uh, uh, w the, the clean power plan has been lamented for a long time, but it looks to them at least like it's going to be uh, legally binding, that coal retirements are not likely to happen because the, key pl the, the clean power plan, I keep saying 111D, I trust you all know these synonyms anyway. Um, it's more likely to come from other regs and the fact that the coal plants have weaker economics at this point. In fact, UBS sees the next wave of capital expenditures for utilities as deriving from the carbon rules and that smart managers, smart management teams will be in front of their regulators now uh, with plans to achieve the clean power plant targets uh, and thus we're likely to get faster capex uh, uh, expenditures rolling. Um, I, with a slight restatement of my favorite line in here to say if you're not at the table, uh, you're, you, they say you're on the table, I say you're on the menu is the way I learned that one. It amounts to the same. They, they actually continued in a different piece about mats itself, the mercury and toxics, and said on that one, uh, does it really matter? And their assertion there is uh, that they don't think many, coal, this is with respect to the Supreme Court uh, considering this issue, that it doesn't really matter. Most of the coal plants will not elect to continue their operations. Few have played in PJM, at least it's capacity market, and that they have resource adequacy plans in place. We don't think that many will opt to delay retirement. So even mats may not be a big play. More importantly, more broadly, the power sector is dramatically changing at this point. Uh, so it may be that just say no isn't a very wise answer. Uh, utility dive recently uh, uh, surveyed 400 uh, electric utility executives and this is hard to read because of the colors I pilfered it right out of their materials but it says what three emerging technologies do you think your utility should invest in now and it's things like energy storage and efficiency and renewables it's you know down the bottom is coal gasification and other and, and carbon capture so that's a pretty clear indication. The second thing they asked, or another thing they asked was, what do you think your utility's business model will be? The top one, dark bar, is the uh, traditional integrated utility model. You see that drops by about three times, and in its place is uh, electric utility services companies and integrators and so forth. Um, so that's, uh, then, a, then a third point they raise is what business models are you guys thinking of? And that's all efficiency and DG and aggregators. And this one was most surprising to me. How do you think EPA should proceed? And they said, this is what, 62% 60, of them said EPA should hold to its current emissions targets and schedules, or 28% said should increase it, make it more aggressive. So almost two-thirds are saying, get her done. So I would suggest to you that, that, that just say no might not be a good place for elected officials to position their states uh, going forward against the industry trends not just EPA's clean power plan. So um, I imagine you all think when EPA finalizes the rule, then the states have to buckle down and attend to those four building blocks, right? Uh, not so. Actually, BSER, which is the best system emission reduction, how EPA built the targets using those four build block, building blocks, goes away. The states get the target, and they get a clean sheet of paper. EPA steps back, lets them work, and moves into approval mode, or not, if the plan's deficient. 
Uh, and then if it is deficient, then EPA needs to, of course, implement a federal plan. This is all pretty uncharted territory. We don't have much guidance. One thing we do know is that states get first crack at implementation. And this reminds me of Alphonse and Gaston. After you, no, after you, I insist, please. It may be that EPA has given too much flexibility or the terms of the act provide too much flexibility. Because the states are saying, what do you want us to do? Give us some guidance here. And, and EPA is saying, whatever you think is best. And the states say, can you give us some direction, please? And EPA says, well, how about some innovation? You know, come in with something. And this is all based on the cooperative federalism that Michael mentioned, that once the standard's set, EPA has to step back and let states come in with the plans that most nearly meet their needs. And in fact, EPA has been litigated for not having done that and lost in the past on other issues associated with haze and ozone and so forth. So you can bet with everybody targeting one lawsuit or another, as Michael covered, against EPA on 111D, that they are going to keep their lips absolutely shut about anything associated with what you, the state, should do. So after you, I insist, please. One thing we do know is that a 111D state compliance plan is not a SIP, and a colleague and I recently did a paper on that, so the website is there. It, it's, hopefully it's legible on your, on your handouts. What it points out, really, is that the act which calls under 111D for similar to Section 110 plans uh, are not the same as, they're not identical to. So there's little state experience with 111D. In fact, um, in the trade, we refer to it as the 40-year-old virgin because it's been used so infrequently in the, as a part of the Clean Air Act. There's relatively little cost and useful life uh, experience that the states have had because usually they're dealing with national ambient air quality standards, which are explicitly told in the act not to consider cost except when it comes to final implementation. The measures, timing, and contents of the state plans are equally uncharted. EPA has given a little bit of what it expects, what it needs, a list of sources, that kind of thing, but pretty little. And there's almost no precedent as well for multi-state options. There was the Northeast Ozone Transport Region under the Act as a Western Regional Air Partnership, but that ground's pretty thin uh, as well. And what the federal response is and when, it, when it's instituted is also uncharted. And so a lot of uh, uncharted ground. Now, one thing that states could do is treat it like a SIP. But if they do that, then they'll foreclose options with respect to all the flexibility that EPA has provided. So I was talking about markets. If I'm a financial advisor, taking the SIP route is selling you bonds, right? They're safe. You know it'll work. They'll be approved. But your returns, your rewards, your opportunities will be far less than if you also had the opportunity to go after equities in other markets. So that, that's the analogy to 110 if you take a standard 110 SIP approach to 111D opportunities. An example of the differences is certainly evident in the way the regulators need to interact, the air guys and the, and the PUC guys. Historically, seeing this two by two matrix, they're just diametrically opposed, right? The, the air guys had the authority to adopt the emissions requirements and the PUC guys have nothing to say about that. And who gets to determine who pays how much for these, this opportunity? PUC has determined all of that, and the air guys get no say. So at last, if nothing else, 111D, the Clean Power Plan, has started those two groups of regulators talking to each other and breaking down the stovepipe. Indeed, just to quote UBS again here, state environmental regulators will become substantially more important um, with responsibilities rivaling those of PUCs uh, and even dictating resource adequacy as they unveil their SIPs. Well, they, UBS called it SIPs because nobody's got a better shorthand, but as we just said, it's not SIPs. Excuse me. Now, you're all aware of EPA's four building blocks. That's what's covered. Michael indicated there's several little spins on those, you know, in the heat rate improvements, stuff you can do with CHP or optimizing the plants. Uh, besides just burning more gas, you could shut down some, some of the aging plants. Renewables, you all know about, that's just lower greenhouse gas uh, generation. And then there's a lot on the efficiency side, you know, behavioral programs, appliance standards, building codes, uh, other efficiency programs. But what you may not be as, as familiar with is there's a host of other options that are not one of these four building blocks. 
What about optimizing grid operations or reducing line losses? You know, there's resistance in the line, so the kilowatt hour you got might have taken 1.1 kilowatt hours to generate. The 0.1 gets lost along the way in resistance. There's some, there's some things we can do about that. What about ESCOs, energy service companies, and privately delivered energy efficiency? Even the states aren't counting that yet. Are you going to let those tons sit on the table uncounted? I hope not. I hope the states aren't. Encourage clean distributed generation, uh, make changes in capacity markets, states that have them. Um, IRP, utility integrated resource cost planning, lowest cost planning. Um, you could in, in, uh, introduce something like a cap and invest program similar to Reggie or something like it. It has a lot of advantages. Or do environmental dispatch, which is not trivial, or carbon adder which one major uh, uh, generation and, tech and transmission company in the upper Midwest, GRE, Great River, it's proposed actually. Uh, and of course, you could always, there's been some talk about carbon taxes uh, re-arising. Indeed, I would call your attention to the fact there isn't just rate-based approaches and mass-based approaches, there's also price-based approaches if a state wants to go that way under its plan, under, if, under its Alphonse and Gaston plan. Um, Finally, what about water even? Well, he said, wait a minute, this is electricity, isn't it? But no, Janet McCabe was asked at a NARUC meeting, National Association of Regulatory Utility Commissioners, a year ago, that given in a state like California, where 19% of the electrical load is water, production, transportation, and treatment of water, would, could water conservation measures be considered 111D compliance opportunities? And she answered affirmatively. There's a menu of options that we've been helping the National Association of Clean Air Agencies with, and it'll list uh, 25 of these, and that's coming out later this spring. I think it'll be end of this month, early May, something like that. So I call your attention to look for that. So the practical effect of 111D's building blocks is then the conventional wisdom is that states will consider these four building blocks and they'll likely do something in each one. Each building block will likely be greater than zero. What I'm suggesting to you is that the actual opportunity is far greater, that there's this other building block or blocks, and that you may indeed have some building blocks that uh, EPA use that you don't use at all. Um, the bottom line is that states can and should think outside of that building block box, and they ought to think in terms, you know, the old saw about better seek forgiveness than ask permission. This is better seek pr approval than ask permission. An example of that, this is EPA's visualizer. It's a, what's called a bridge chart, how you get from here to there. And uh, the, the uh, bar on the left shows their current or the 2012 emissions rate. The bar on the right shows the target rate. And then the steps in between and how they got them. Uh, building block one is uh, the, the heat rate improvements. And what Texas could do is alleviate the burden on the plants themselves by instead redoubling their energy efficiency efforts. So if you make all those reductions come from a redoubling of energy efficiency, then you don't have to touch the, uh, the, the on-site uh, heat rate improvements at the plants. Another thing to be mindful of is let's not be only thinking about generation units. Um, there are a lot of co-benefits that states need to keep in mind as well. Um, in this chart, and I'm sorry I can't point at it because of the screen, but the two by two matrix here is air quality benefits up and down, climate benefits right and left. And there are things you can do for air quality, like install scrubbers that, that hurt the climate because they have parasitic load, they take energy themselves, so they emit more CO2. And conversely, there's things you can do for the climate, like diesels, that hurt air quality because there's more particulate emissions and whatnot. So the place you want to be is in that upper right corner where the efficiency is and in contemplating those multiple benefits, the bottom line is that good air quality choices can help with 111D and vice versa. And though, both of those choices, if done right, can also help with water. And you can approach these things on an integrated multi-pollutant basis. And there's another link there. We call it the integrated multi-pollutant planning for energy and air quality. You can actually w add water to that, but I couldn't figure out how to make the acronym work. Um, example of that, uh, you know that EPA's uh, Clean Air Act Advisory, uh, Science Advisory Committee is considering revising the ozone next. All of those gray dots are what would be added to the mix depending on what the committee and what ultimately EPA decides to do with the ozone next. You can see it's a near doubling, maybe even more, of the areas that could be in non-attainment. 
Um, water is a main uh, critical issue. The black areas here are uh, high stress for water. And as you know, steam electric generating units need steam, which means they need water. And plants have been derated or even shut down uh, due to water temperature and quantity issues before. So this, this is a real issue for those plants as well. And keep in mind risks generally with the industry changing so rapidly major capital expenditures at this point looking beyond five years and most of them have been amortized over 30 it's like what are you crazy you you think you can predict what's going to happen for 30 years you're really looking at a rare stranded cost opportunity i don't think any of us want to take that opportunity so again you have efficiency down in the lower corner the least cost and the least risk the problem is that efficiency is really hard to measure at least there's not a whole lot of precedent for it some of you may know that these rings on this power plant stack are where the continuous emission monitors are. Those probes go in the stack and measure the concentrations of pollutants in the flue gas, and that gets sent to the plant and to EPA and the local uh, state agency as well. They measure the emissions in the plant, which I represent with measuring tape, and then all of that feeds into uh, EPA's SIPs. And that can actually be SIPs because these are sulfur and NOx and so forth. Excuse me again. Now, energy efficiency, of course, is its energy, so it should be measured and fed into SIPs in the same way, right? Well, yeah, except like the bulb shows, there's millions of these sources. Nobody knows where they are and when they're on and so forth. Well, true, but, well, wait a minute. EPA also regulates millions of other things. They're called vehicles, and they don't know where they are and when they're run and how they're run either, and yet they use statistical analyses and models and assumptions and penetration figures to work numbers into SIPs. Why can't we do that with efficiency? There's some other simple ways too. Uh, many PUCs that have utility sponsored demand side management efficiency programs, if a program's been done over and over again, they don't uh, uh, go to quite such a heavy evaluation measurement and, and um, um, uh, yeah, measurement, evaluation, and Verification, thank you. EM and V, the, the acronyms get so deep in the air world, we just live with them, we don't bother translating. Why can't we have deemed, they, they, so what they do in those circumstances, they have deemed reductions. You do this program, you install this many bulbs, we'll deem you as having achieved this much reduction. Why can't, reduction in energy. Why can't we do the same thing with reduction in emissions? There's some assumptions you have to make with that. What, what, was the system average emissions or whatnot, but it can be done. You know, this is a case where you can really let excellent get in the way of the good. Uh, there's other things you can do. EPA has what's called the AP42 emission factors, which is sort of a, a menu, and the better your data, the more credit you get. It could do something similar for, for energy efficiency, or it has mobile source models. Why can't it create models uh, for efficiency as well? You know, in, in pops your inputs and out pops your emission reductions. They've even taken some steps in that direction. They haven't just credentialed them yet as qualifiable for 111D plan compliance. And remember, EPA has more flexibility under 111D than they do under 110. Everything isn't scripted in the act like it is under 110. So they should be able to do this stuff readily. States should also consider uh, joining together with their colleagues in, in other regions. The larger the market area, of course, we all know, the likely the, the more cost opportunities exist, so lower costs will be, more compliance opportunities exist, so lower costs will be. Um, it might be wise, for example, to try to align your state partners with your electricity balancing area, your RTO, if you have it, or balancing area, if not. Uh, many states don't wanna go jump in bed whole hog with another state or other states. It's complex, it's political, et cetera. But some are, uh, and notably the West, are thinking about, well, couldn't we all just agree on, say, renewable energy? And we'll, we'll measure it the same way, we'll track it the same way, we'll count it the same way. Uh, couldn't we do likewise with efficiency? So the Western states are already breaking that trail. And a lot of that infrastructure already exists. As you, many of you know, there are strong rec markets, renewable energy, energy certificates, which are a commodity used for meeting uh, renewable portfolio standards in the states. 
Um, that tracking system is already pretty healthy on a national basis, and there's very little that has to be done to make it an efficiency and renewable tracking system. Uh-oh, I'm getting some message. I hope I didn't do that more, Emory. Good, he didn't blow up quick. <laughs> Um, on federal enforceability, something I should raise because that's caused a lot of attention. You know that uh, a lot of folks have said EPA wants to come in, at least in, uh, PUC commissioners are quite concerned about EPA coming in and taking over their efficiency programs. Um, I think you all know that vertebrae um, inside the beltway here. Uh, could EPA do that? Would EPA do that? Has EPA ever done that? Uh, maybe and no and no. Um, what, what actually happens is EPA determines that you're, you have a deficiency and notifies the state, uh, gives the state the opportunity to correct that deficiency, and then if it doesn't or can't, EPA can implement its federal plan. It doesn't come in and run your plans. Um, Sue Tierney's fond of pointing out when she was Environment Commissioner in Massachusetts, there was a 20-year saga of EPA not uh, of the state of Massachusetts not succeeding with its plans and EPA still didn't come in and put the hammer down and run its programs and that all by the way is what happens under 110 we just said 111 is even more flexible than that so how likely is it do you think not very what will the federal plan look like another big area of interest I don't know either right nobody except maybe somebody inside the agency does what we do know is that the states will relinquish their Alphonse and Gaston rights. Right? They won't have first crack. And EPA, we also know, is freed from adherence to the building blocks. It used the building blocks to set the target. End of story. I got the target. Now I can do what I want because you said you didn't want to do it. You just said no. Well, that's interesting. EPA is like, unlikely to do a different plan for every state, right? It's likely to develop a federal plan and implement it in the states. Like maybe, say, a mass-based cap-and-trade system? So could it be that EPA is being accused of wanting to do a mass-based cap-and-trade system and it just say no states would drive it toward that outcome? That might be a backfire that uh, the forces suggesting just say no might not have anticipated. There's numerous other issues. Uh, what's what's going to happen to the glide path, treatment of nuclear units, treatment of renewables and efficiency, baseline? Safety valves, we could talk about those if they're of interest, but I don't want to do so uh, alone. Um, but don't, whatever you do, expect that all the answers will occur, you know, be clear in the final rule. EPA is trying to do this on a schedule. You all know the reasons for that are multiple. Uh, no one's ever done it before. There will be plenty of questions after EPA issues the final rule. So the key takeaways for you. Recognize that 111D is not a SIP, right? Everybody repeat after me, not a SIP. Leave this room saying not a SIP. That's your new mantra. Um, think outside the building blocks. Help your states think integrated in terms of these multiple benefits so they don't come back at you with ozone and come back at you with PM. Um, you get it all at once. Think regional. Think least cost. You notice in these discussions, not a whole lot of people are thinking least cost. There are opportunities for lower cost options, mostly efficiency. And then finally, to just paraphrase JFK, uh, don't ask EPA what it needs to be. Right? Ask what you want it to be and submit that. So, thanks very much. I hope we have a good dialogue from here. Thanks so much. Well, we've had two great presentations in terms of looking at so many of the issues uh, around 111 B and D under the Clean Power Plan. And uh, let's open it up for any questions or comments that you may have. Take advantage of having these guys here. Okay, and please identify yourself. Okay. Uh, I'm Ivy May with the uh, Virginia Chapel here. Um, uh, Mr. Bird, you mentioned that. Um, uh, that uh, uh, enforcement would begin in 2020. Um, can you tell me what would enforcement look like? I mean, if you presumably you're enforcing against the plants, um, but if you've got a recalcitrant state, how does that? What would happen? It's a very good question. I, I don't know that there's a good answer to it. Compliance uh, under the existing proposed plan. Compliance under the existing proposed plan is anticipated to begin in 2020. Um, Section 
doesn't section 111d doesn't spell out what the penalties would be for non-compliance um, so what would enforcement look like um, I, I imagine it would be something similar to what you see with SIPs, which is an effort to cooperate for a long period of time, and um, there, there's no ability to withhold funds or anything like that. Um, so, I'm not quite sure. Maybe somebody else has an answer to that. My, my only contribution on that was uh, we might have some insights as a result of when the federal plan is proposed, which is uh, supposed to be done at the same time as the 111D rule is finalized. So I, I don't know if EPA will give us more insights into that issue at that time, but that would be the next place I'd look. Hi, Tom Tyler um, from the Environmental Council of the States. Thank you to you both. Um, EP, uh, the Supreme Court, or the courts have upheld uh, EPA for the mercury and air toxics rule and for the transport rule. Um, and people I know are looking at those and thinking, is there any indication of how EPA will fare for the 111D clean power plan? And I know there was language from the courts, and I don't remember which case it was from, saying, you know, yeah, we're going to uphold this, but EPA shouldn't take vague parts of the Clean Air Act, uh, and it was something like that are narrow and drive a truck through them. Um, I think a lot of people read that to be at least one uh, judge and maybe more indicating you were looking at 111D. Um, can you remind us which case that was from, who said it, um, and, and if, if we should be looking at that as an indication of how EPA might fare uh, when all of this litigation comes out uh, right after the rule goes final? Thanks. I believe that that's UARG uh, case, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong on that. I believe it's Justice Scalia. Um, and. Um, I believe that the issues are distinguishable, that they're different. The, the issue in that case was whether, that, that was being referenced at that point, was whether EPA could start to regulate facilities that it does not currently regulate, and whether these facilities that emit 100,000 tons per year of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions um, could now be required to get uh, prevention of significant deterioration and Title V operating permits whereas previously they don't because they didn't meet or they don't meet the uh, existing thresholds. Um, so that would be an expansion of EPA's authority to facilities that currently are not under EPA's, um, under these programs. Uh, that's not what you're looking at under Section 111D. You're not looking at an expansion of EPA authority, uh, permitting authority to any facilities that aren't currently um, under their jurisdiction. And to the extent that there's a concern, and I think that there is a concern that um, EPA will try and go beyond the fence line. And it may be that that reference in part voices, gives voice to that concern that EPA will make some effort to try and directly regulate the state PSCs or PUCs, or they will try and implement energy efficiency, renewable energy programs directly in the states, um, which would be an expansion of EPA authority. They don't do that. Um, I myself see, believe that EPA is well aware that that would raise uh, legal, legal, legal problems, so I don't see that as particularly likely. But. Uh, so Sean Kimmel with Congressman Dan Lipinski's office. Uh, so there's some discussion about the uh, amount of flexibility that's been offered to the states and how um, it's an opportunity but also a challenge. Can you discuss the resources that will be available to states to um, help them in making those decisions? Well, I think that's another unanswered question. Uh, I, th I think that EPA has indicated that they are preparing to have some kind of fund, um, which if not directly targeted for that purpose, um, is only slightly circuitous to, to be helpful in that regard, but I'm really not um, on the front lines of the financial side of that. So um, I think they're aware of it. I think it, it, you know, ideally they will be doing the kind of modeling that will assist uh, and be pretty generalizable for states, uh, but certainly they have to get past this final first. One of the problems is that 111D uh, what it does contain statutorily is pretty thin, uh, as I indicated, because the rest is left flexible. But what it does contain is uh, is some reasonably tight time frames. Uh, 
you know, the state air directors are used to submitting SIPs over two and three and four year periods. Um, and 111D calls for a, a one year period, which EPA stretched if you work with other states to a two year period and figured out some waiver or some, uh, some emergency provision that could have a third year extension. Uh, but that's, that's not just EPA's imaginings, that's actually part of 111D. So they're aware of it. I, I trust that they'll work on it, but I actually don't know specifically how. Sorry. Hi, Paul Donahue-Vallet from the Department of Energy. So I know that 11D implementation plans are not SIPs, but is there a way that you can say how EPA will um, evaluate plans that are submitted, what sort of stringency they'll apply, and what things might trip states up when they, in, when, in what they apply for a plan? Um, I, I think the answer is no with increasing vehemence. <laughs> no, they haven't provided much guidance on that other than the simple things like list of and, you know, whatever you're doing. Uh, but w what criteria they're going to use to evaluate, especially where um, states depart from the rate-based approach. So if they're using a mass-based approach, they have to do a conversion. EPA's prescribed a couple of ways to do that, but there's a lot of data issues there and states may differ from EPA's you know, initial simple interpretations. So the, the short answer on the first question about how EPA, what criteria they will use, I think is another thing we need to wait for the final rule. Um, the other two are even less certain. So. <coughs> I, I guess I would just add that, and, and are likely not all to be totally answered. I think the first one criteria will be answered reasonably well in the final rule. Um, the others, not so much, probably. Uh, there'll be an evolution here, uh, a sort of a case law uh, character to it, even though it's more regulatory proceeding than case law, but some, something of that nature. I, I think I would just add that I think the standard will be something akin to adequacy. That will be the, the legal standard, and um, what is an adequate plan will be one that EPA is persuaded is sufficient to reach the standard that's set in terms of how they're dealing with 25 different building blocks and, and so forth and what exactly they want to see, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But I agree, I, I think that there will be um, ample communications with the states um, as well as guidance and, and the like. I, I actually hope they take that criteria because that will allow states a lot of freedom to do a lot of things like uh, estimating energy efficiency emissions as if they were vehicles. And then if EPA is persuaded it's adequate, they can go ahead. And if there's any uh, true up or reconciliation necessary at a later time where EPA um, finds that it's inadequate, then the state can go back and fix that. You know, do another measure or do that measure, measure on a more stringent basis or you know, some corrective action uh, rather than coming in and running the efficiency program, which is not gonna happen. Can you actually ask a question? I, I, I have a question for you, Ken, which is... Um, oh, no fair. I didn't know we were going to do Improvise. So it, it's, it's directly related to this question and about calculating efficiency measures. And um, I'm wondering if you could explain a bit why it hasn't been done yet, if, there's, if there are reasons for that. And particularly, the concern that immediately rises to my mind as well there's, there are studies that show when efficiencies increase, use also increases. So how, how do you account for that? Wow, that's, that's really three questions. Uh, uh, to, to, to address the last one first, and then I'll have to be reminded of the first two, um, what Michael talks about is, is rebound, that when, when energy prices drop or efficiency increases, there's a tendency to use more of it. You always hear about rebound and Jevon's paradox and so forth, and because it's nearly free now, I leave the lights on, I don't bother to turn them off. You never hear about spillover, which is the opposite effect, which is when uh, I went and installed the solar array, and my neighbor said, that's cool, and he installed it. We just measured the guy that got the rebate or whatever. Never any mention of spillover. And that is what little research has been done on that, shows it to be as big or bigger than rebound. So rebound is another one of those uh, red swimming vertebrae. Um, 
by and large. Um, and I've succeeded in forgetting the first. <laughs> the, first the, the first question was just, can you, is there an, is there an explanation, a historic explanation for why these yeah. calculations haven't already been taken? Yeah, I, I, it, it's a really good question. I think it's evolutionary. Originally, there was enough sort of low-hanging fruit at the end of the pipe that the end of pipe control measures were the way uh, pollution control solutions were, were crafted, is what people thought of. Uh, eventually along the way efficiency became clear as a more cost effective, sometimes even negative cost, it saves money, uh, approach. But there was nothing really in the act and that, that, that supported it or encouraged it. In fact, arguably quite the contrary because most of EPA's life it has been uh, uh, undertaking measures that directly reduce emissions at a facility. So I, I put this scrubber in at this plant and it reduced these emissions. That's a much harder trail to you know, leave the breadcrumbs along the path for efficiency. Because I reduce, uh, you know, I, I reduce my energy use, so the electric plant nearby reduced their generation, right? Well, maybe not. It might have been a different plant. Or it might have even been a plant in a different state. And now it's not even under the same jurisdiction. How are we going to track that? Because we can't track the electrons. Okay, now we really got a problem. Best we just ignore it and not do efficiency. And that's basically what EPA has done until uh, 2004 when it allowed Connecticut a little bit of leeway because Connecticut had such stringent legislated energy efficiency programs. So EPA felt it possible to go all the way to 6% they would allow up to 6% of the, the state's obligations to be met through efficiency. Well, that's not exactly cut and loose, is it? Um, so, what, if nothing else, what 111D does, you know, set aside the merits of whether 110 really does say you have to track electrons, we know that 111D does not say that. So, EPA, you can run with this one. Now, the trouble, of course, is they haven't got any infrastructure, intellectual, basis yet for moving that forward. We at RAP are trying to provide some of it to them with deemed reductions or mobile source analogy and hopefully they'll use it. But um, this is, if there's a place where EPA could fall down, it would be on this front. And you can't depend on states on doing this. I was an air director for 40 years. Air directors have been told what to do under delegated authority of the act from EPA. Uh, I'm a mechanic. I'm waiting there now saying, what am I supposed to do? Right. In fact, I left out two slides which cover this, but if you want to talk about energy efficiency savings, energy savings, I'm, I, I, we're going to get into EM and V, we're going to get into time of use, we're going to get into marginal plants, and I'm going to run screaming from the room. Right. And, and if I stay in the room, now we can talk about translating energy savings into emission reductions. And now we're going to talk about what what time of day it occurred and whether it was net versus gross and whether there were free riders and now I'm I don't understand any of this stuff I'm really running from the room I know how to solve this problem I'll just permit another gas plant and that's the dash to gas and then 30 years from now we have the same problem and the utilities behind me are saying yeah yeah, yeah we can rate base that that's a good idea right so EPA could screw this up but it's not in any way that you normally hear about in the news. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Terry Hill with the Passive House Institute. And um, in your slide, but many other technologies and policy options exist. Is there any talk about including the grids, existing grids vulnerability to attack as one of the items that could be included in this? Um, that, that's a really good question that should be under that general category I referenced of co-benefits. Um, I think I mentioned security there somewhere, or maybe I'm thinking of something different uh, that I've been working on, but it should be included in there. It does not relate to emissions. You know, it's not energy generation or avoidance thereof. 
uh, with associated emissions. But it is one of those co-benefits like water, like dollars, like ozone, like you know, uh, other co-benefits. Um, in fact, I don't mean to, to too, too much here, but um, RAP recently did a paper a year ago called Re Realizing the Benefits of the, what, the Full Benefits of Energy Efficiency. And it includes things like productivity and comfort and so forth. Usually they're all just kind of lumped together and said other stuff that we're not going to assign any money to. Um, security is one of those. But you tell me if it's a very important one or not. And particularly after we saw parts of the grid here in D.C. go down yesterday, right? Okay, Tom? I do have questions for uh, Kenneth as well, but first for Michael, it depends on how long you let me ask him. Um, you were listing the legal arguments in Murray Energy, which of course is timely since it'll be argued tomorrow. Um, and, you know, we can be sure that those will come, no matter where that goes, uh, even if, if that that may stop 111D in its tracks, but if it doesn't, those are same arguments will come back. And, and on two of them, the arguments were compelling, but you gave reasons against them, but very common sense. One was on Tenth Amendment, and I think the point you were making was cooperative federalism is well established, and the idea is states aren't forced to do anything. If they don't do it, EPA will just do it instead. Mm -hmm. I think that's your argument. And then the other one uh, that I noted was that uh, this isn't a taking because uh, not each regulation, you know, could be a taking on the investor-backed expectations. So I'm curious, um, I trust those are both well-established legally, so you have reasons to believe that even though they're being argued by the plaintiffs, they won't succeed now or later. Um, and I was also wondering if, if the plaintiffs succeed on the idea that it violates the Tenth Amendment, could that take down the whole cooperative federalism structure? It's well established under 110, but they'll be looking at it anew under 111, and depending on if they blew it up under 111, could that be an issue for the way the Clean Air Act has worked for decades? I think my, my first response is I believe that these are arguments that were raised by Peabody Energy as an intervener, not by the plaintiffs, yeah. um, but that they will be presented, that Professor Tribe will be given a chance to argue these points. Um, the argument that there's something different about the 111D uh, setup um, in regards to the cooperative federalism is very dangerous. Um, could it, there, uh, yes, could it explode the whole the whole operation? I'm not I'm not really an alarmist, so I wouldn't I wouldn't go that far. But it would certainly run contrary to all of the jurisprudence and to the way that the statute and other statutes have operated for a long time. Um, the way that I understand the, the clean power plant and the way that uh, Ken has discussed the, the building blocks and the relationship to BSER, um, it, it just seems to me that there's, uh, there's no reason to believe that this is different than anything that's been approved many, many times before. Robert Meltz with the Congressional Research Service. Uh, it's quite true that historically the mechanisms that have always been described as cooperative federalism have not been susceptible to Tenth Amendment challenge. The Supreme Court decision in New York versus the United States is the main one. However, uh, people in my office who attended the King versus Burwell argument said that for the very first time, uh, Kennedy, and I believe they said Sotomayor, raised the possibility that some cooperative federalism mechanisms could, in certain circumstances, be challengeable under the Tenth Amendment, which would be quite a new frontier. Uh, great. Thank you very, very much for your comment. Okay. Other questions or comments in the back? Hi. I'm with the Heinrich Boll Foundation. I'm wondering how the Quadrennial Energy Review will affect the implementation of the Clean Power Plan, or if it will. I could almost do carte blanche with I don't know for most of these questions tonight, and this this would be another one. Um, I I don't think too much. I, I think ultimately DOE uh, and perhaps our colleagues here from DOE could elaborate. But um, my understanding is that it's focused this initial quadrennial energy review on 
transmission infrastructure or you know more upstream kinds of elements um, that would have less direct uh, relationship to generating units though obviously it's important for a number of reasons uh, renewable penetration so forth um, so I don't want to suggest that there be no relationship but I think it'll you know it's a first waffle too so it it probably won't have sunk in as much as it might or be as developed with future focus areas of future quadrennial reviews um, that would be more helpful to the states in implementation. I think that will all happen with time. Let's face it, this is, you know, what we've seen, what, three or four revision of the uh, ozone NACs, a couple of revisions of particulate matter NACs. We'll, we'll see that uh, I think the 111D requires an eight-year review of of uh, new source performance standards, so we'll, we'll be back. It's just that this is the first time, so it's pretty groundbreaking in, in terms of the interest levels. Do you have any insight? No, I have nothing to add to that. Does anybody else here have any comment with regard to the the Hi, I'm Audrey Tauscher, Tauscher International. My question is not with the Quadrennial Energy Review. But it's about um, what you think the realistic likelihood of EPA's time frame for implementing the rule is. Um, reliability has been an issue that's come up a lot by RTOs, FERC, NARUC, and they've said we need more time to figure out dispatch rules, transmission issues. So I'm wondering if one of you or both of you could comment on whether you think the implementation will be delayed. Boy, is that, yeah, that would be uh, one that I would never want to say never on, but um, I doubt that the finalization of the rule will be delayed. Um, and EPA has a pretty careful tightrope to walk <coughs> in terms of implementation because the extent that things are specified under 111D in the Act, they're shorter rather than longer. I think where you're apt to see the kind of delay that you're talking about is uh, perhaps in the form of enforcement discretion or, you know, I don't, I don't want to say looking the other way in the pejorative sense, but EPA understands from its own experience it's the first time it's done this, so it's also the first time states have done this. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if they do incorporate some kind of safety valve. There are typically emergency waiver provisions in most federal acts anyway, so that wouldn't be surprising. I would suggest that the history of uh, uh, of reliability concerns uh, at this stage of the game um, being ultimately manifest in reality is uh, is pretty thin. You know, there we mass was the end of life as we know it too, right? And then it turned out to be a nothing burger. Um, and I I have well I, a, a, a saying that I coined once upon a time facing this kind of situation was. Uh, Ask an engineer to do something and you get nothing but problems. Tell an engineer to do something and you get nothing but solutions. So we are at the stage where we're asking the engineers and they're thinking everything that could go wrong. When EPA signs that dotted line, it is now telling the engineers and lots will go wrong, but everything won't go wrong. And some new good things will occur. And I suspect that we might be in a situation, especially as the industry changes, especially as demand declines with improved technologies and, and alternate generation, distributed generation opportunities, so forth, that we might find it to be an equal nothing burger. I would just add, I second the point, I don't, I don't see EPA's proposed rule becoming finalized any later. I don't see any delay there. there there's a clear reason to, to move that along. As far as implementation, the, sub the late submission of plans similar to SIPs would not be a surprise. It's happened before, right? There, I mean, things are handed in late. I've done it myself. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and, this is, and, there's, and there are a lot of technical difficulties here, and there are political issues as well, right? So some, some plans will not be submitted at all, um, and so, but they won't be late necessarily until, the, until they're late. Um, so, yeah. Go ahead. Last question. Hi, Davis Burroughs, Morning Consult. Um, 
as you've discussed, this, the Clean Power Plan is kind of fighting a battle on at least three different fronts here. You've got one with Congress, uh, one with the federal courts, um, one potentially with the White House uh, if it changes, you know, if the Oval Office changes hands uh, in 2017, and then you can even add uh, states into that who either refuse or, or fail to meet their targets. So I'd just be curious to hear your thoughts on which of those challenges pose the greatest threat to the success in the future um, of the proposal. That's a short, easy question, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not even sure how you'd handicap the three. I, um, in, you know, rather than, <laughs> I'm in Washington so I can duck the question, right? Uh, um, I, I really don't know how you would handicap or, or assess them relatively, but I would suggest that, you know, Mother Nature bats last, right? And climate change isn't going away. So whatever we don't do now, we'll have to do later in one way or another, a different way, um, probably more costly way because it's, it'll be that much harder. So uh, I really don't know. All of those could be serious hurdles, as you suggest. Yeah, I would, I would second that. Uh, I, I do think that, you know, the rule will be final by the time this administration leaves. Um, and so what would have to happen for the next administration is a refusal to enforce um, or a um, rescission of the rule. And they would have to go through notice and comment and, and that would be a big hullabaloo. And that, that has happened, of course, um, but it's not, it's not the common practice um, to, to rescind existing rules. Um, so I, I think that I would handicap that one as a little bit less likely than the others. Um, the federal courts, uh, th there are some legal vulnerabilities, I think, in the, in the, um, in the way that EPA has gone about it, but um, I think it's fully defensible and, and likely to win. Um, otherwise, who knows? <laughs> that sounds like a good final word. <laughs> and um, I just wanted to let you all know that we are hoping to do a series looking at the Clean Power Plan and to take a look um, at what some states are looking at in terms of approaches, kinds of things that uh, Ken was talking about, how much are states really looking at that, to also look at what a variety of businesses are doing that are also talking about opportunities and how they see that and how they are attempting to move. And so we would welcome your suggestions uh, in terms of things that you would like us, like to see us uh, uh, bring forward in these sessions. Also want to mention that on April 21st, we are uh, going to be uh, hosting with WIRES a whole day long session on a transmission that will be getting into grid optimization issues, looking at different security issues, looking at 111D mm -hmm. and so, and uh, the, the interplay of renewables in terms of the grid and how that affects all of this uh, as well. So I hope that you'll be interested in, in uh, participating in that because that will get into some of the issues that were raised here as well. And of course, we welcome you to continue this whole conversation online. Uh